Good day, folks. So good to be here with you again. I've said that quite often over the last few years, but I do truly mean it. And I thank you so much for giving me some airtime or whatever you want to call it on your, in your places. And uh, I pray and hope that the last few days, or at least the last week uh, since we last had a chat together, that you have been blessed by God in many ways, that you've realized his hand over your life. And for those of you who might be hearing this and going, well, look at that schmuck, he believes in God, uh, why don't you stick around and find out what I might say, and you never know. Anyway, today as we wrap up our series, Ephesians Blueprint, which we've been on, on for over three months, we're going to revisit Paul's teaching in chapter 4. Specifically, we want to look at verse 1 to 16. And you might be wondering why. Well, I could give you a lot of different reasons. For example, possibly God by his Holy Spirit uh, uh, has led us back to chapter 4. Or maybe when we were initially in chapter 4 uh, and we, we went through that text, we were not able to cover all the points that Paul had made there. Maybe the pastor, for very practical reasons, is not ready to move on to something new. Or maybe some questions have remained. For example, let me give you a question. How does the contemporary church reflect the truths, the biblical truths, that Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to put into this letter that was written so long ago? So why? Well, my answer would be most likely it's for all the reasons mentioned, all the reasons above. Please turn in your Bibles to chapter 4 of the letter to the Ephesians, and we will be uh, reading from verse 1 through to 16. More for the context than anything else at this time. Chapter 4, verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit, in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Verse 7, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith now the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with, it, with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Lord, bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Our Lord God, we thank you so much for today, for this new day. Thank you for blessing us with it. And for those who are listening to this and watching or one or the other or both, Lord, I pray whatever situation they're in, that God, you would uh, uh, just surround them with your love and if they need healing, touch your bodies, touch your minds, touch their hearts, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this word. We uh, ask you by your spirit to help us not only art understand it, but articulate it and to live it out as well. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, as we read through Paul's statements, I hope, we no I hope you notice the overarching theme that is cre clearly evident here. And it's the unity of the church or the, the unity of the body of Christ. And when we think about unity in groups, generally speaking, when groups or peoples are united in a common cause or project, unity is often seen as a positive characteristic. Now, as we, as we consider how Paul describes unity in the church, 
we keep in mind really the key rule when reading and studying the Bible. Context, context, context. And we're going to look here at a little bit of the historical context to start with. Because it's, I think it's important to Paul's discussion concerning unity of the church in Ephesus in that particular first century setting. So Ephesus at the time of Paul's letter was a place to be if, if you were a worshiper of the pantheon of gods, of the Greek and Roman gods. In particular, Ephesus was known for its temple, uh, the temple to the goddess Artemis or Diana. It was one of the seven uh, wonders of that ancient world. And because of this, a large part of the business and the commerce in the marketplace in Ephesus was directly related to the temple and the worship of Artemis. For example, making of you know, trinkets and uh, images and household shrines and, and so forth and so on. Additionally, Ephesus at the time of Paul's letter was uh, the center of trade in Asia at that time. It was also prominent as a center of culture and arts, for it possessed the largest amphitheater in that world at the time, above 50,000 seats. That's quite a bit, quite a lot of seats. And it was here in this pagan culture, cultural setting that, that Paul arrived in Ephesus during his second missionary journey. If you ever wonder what those look like, flip to the back of your Bibles, you might have maps there. It'll show you his first, second, and third journey. And Paul then stayed for two years at Ephesus, and it became, because of that, the hub, if you will, the central command, if you will, for the evangelizing of the rest of the area, Asia. So the question is for us to ask is, what has this to do with the unity of the church that Paul speaks to here in chapter 4? Well, there's a number of ways we could tackle this. But when we look at the book of Acts, if you look in chapter 19, we see their strong opposition and objection to the gospel and that created a lot of opposition to the church in Ephesus, no doubt. And as more and more Ephesians came to faith, and more and more opposition, opposition will come along to it. So in large part, some of the opposition, some of the, thing, the things that were coming on to the church then, would impact the unity of the church. The cultural, religious, political, financial, and household pressure would have been affecting the lives of the believers in the church at Ephesus, as well as the growing uh, concern of false teachers and their heretical teachings. This would have obviously been part of the reason Paul is talking about unity in this, in this letter. And it's no wonder that Paul begins his letter reminding the Ephesians of some important things in chapter 1. Paul would say that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ chose us and him before the foundation of the world. That God had blessed the believers in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Paul would speak like that. That the Ephesian believers had been chosen by God to be what? To be holy and blameless before him. It was, and it was in love that God had predestined the believers in Ephesus for adoption to himself as children or sons through Jesus Christ. And this was, had been God's purpose and will from the very beginning before the foundation of the world. Wow. And it was God's glorious grace, by that glorious grace, that the Ephesian believers had received forgiveness of their trespasses, forgiveness of their sins. And therefore, because of these things that God had done through Christ, the Ephesian believers had obtained an inheritance, which was sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. My friends, indeed, these ancient Christians were the saints as Paul calls them in verse 1 of chapter 1 in Ephesus, faithful to Christ Jesus. You just read through chapter 1, verse 1 to about 14 or 15. But here's the point. Even before we deal with the unity regarding the flesh and blood church, in other words, the people in the church itself, Paul has settled an important theological and biblical truth concerning the church in Ephesus and actually the church to this day. The believers, because of their faithfulness to Jesus, my friends, all believers everywhere today are united as one people in Christ. That is unity. Yes, the believer, Ephesian believers, as mentioned, was facing opposition from their pagan culture. All true Christians today will face opposition from the world around them on all sorts of ways. But yet, in the same way the Ephesians had put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and thus were united with Jesus, believers today, you and me around the world are one people of God for many nations, many tongues, many languages, united in Christ. 
So we need to understand that before we talk about some of the other stuff. So from this spiritual reality of the people of God, uh, we now turn to the people of God as made manifest as what the Bible calls the church or the body of Christ. And chapter 4 to 6 forms Paul's exhortations concerning how you and I, and even the Ephesians back then, would walk out what is, the, what is true of the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places that we have now because of Christ. And focusing on chapter 4, Paul reminded the Ephesians to walk in a manner worthy of their calling. Verse 1. In other words, walk, as Paul would say in the next chapter, verse 5, verse 8, as children of light, and take no part in the unfruitful works of the darkness. Chapter 5, verse 10. So how would one describe walking in a worthy manner of their calling? Well, certainly in one part, the characteristics of this walk would be evident in the believer. And we see them in verse 2 here of chapter 4. The believer with all, would walk with all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love. Paul put it this way in his letter to the Galatians. In chapter 5, verse 16, he said, walk by the Holy Spirit. And then we go on and read there, and we see that the, when we walk with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will produce fruit in our lives. And it's described for us in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It's described as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's not fruits of the Holy Spirit, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit will manifest these characteristics. So now I wonder, do we see, or do you see, how these works, works itself out in the church concerning unity? Not only are we united to one another because of our union with Jesus, which is described for us in chapter 1 through 3, we manifest this incredible spiritual reality and unity by our love for one another as we what? As we bear with one another in love, verse 2. And because of our union with Christ together, we are to be what? Verse 3, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Another way to translate this is spare no effort to maintain the unity of of the spirit and the bond of peace. And from there, Paul gives an example of this kind of unity by pointing to the perfect unity of the Godhead in which the church exists and lives and breathes. We see this from verse 4 to 6. Now, I don't want to go through every verse there, but I do want to give you a very simple, overly simple, by the way, paraphrase to sort of make some of the points to make the point, actually, about this unity. We could say it this way, verse 4 to 6. There is one church with one Holy Spirit. It mentions one Lord. We could say one Christ, because that's what the reference is to. One Christ in whom we place our faith, our trust, and one church, or one baptism. And then we have one God and Father over all, and through all, and in all. And that's so interesting because it's from this unity of the Godhead that the church dwells in that Paul now moves to the diversity of the spiritual gifts in the church. We have this unity that God uh, put into place in the body of Christ or the one new society, if you will, as Stott calls it. But in this unity of the Godhead that the church exists in, that every believer exists in, we see the diversity of the spiritual gifts in the church. And from verse 7 to 11, which we could have the heading of the unity of the church, we have a secondary heading, and it could go like this. The diverse gifts given by Jesus to the church. The diverse gifts given to the Jesus, by Jesus to the church. Before we kind of go into it a little bit more, I want to address the elephant in the room. And this is simply that every believer... Every believer receives a spiritual gift upon their conversion. Every believer, or even gifts. My friends, no one is exempt. No one gets to set it out. That's not what it was intended for. So the question we need to ask ourselves, what is my gift? And the second one is, am I employing that gift as directed by the Holy Spirit? But anyways, let's move on and look at verse 7. It tells us there that each one of us has received what Paul called grace. 
which he then uh, explains what he meant by grace by quoting then from the Old Testament, Psalm 68, 16 at verse 8. And then he goes on with a further explanation from verse 9 to 10. And here's the point. Jesus, by virtue of his incarnation, that is coming to earth on that first Christmas, by his life and death and resurrection and ascension, has brought the believer into union with him, and as head over the church, appoints spiritual gifts to each believer. And what is interesting to note in all of this, that out of these variety, this diversity of gifts, the unity of the church is preserved, is supported, and it actually grows. So now we move from the giver of the spiritual gifts, Christ through his spirit, we move on to, as Stott put it, quote, the character of the spiritual gifts. The character. And the standout character, really, as we've been talking already about these spiritual gifts, is that they're extremely wide-ranging. Wide-ranging is what Stott would say. And we have three lists in the Bible that list spiritual gifts. For example, Romans 12, verse 6 and 8. I'm not going to read these. They're there for you to read. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11, and 1 Corinthians 12, 28. But keep in mind, these are not exhaustive lists. The diversity is not contained in all of these three lists. But anyways, with this in mind, we look at verse 11. We find that Christ appointed specific offices, as it's often called, or some might say various ministers given to the church. Let's read verse 11 together. And he gave, that is, and he gave the apostles, pardon me, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. Please notice the phrase he gave. Again, Paul reminds us that Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. We want to pause here at the word apostles. How are we to understand he gave the apostles? Who are these apostles that Paul's talking about? What are these apostles to do? So when we consider these questions in the context of the New Testament, we find that the word apostle has three primary meanings. Three primary meanings. One way we can apply the word apostle is to all of us, to every believer in Christ. We go to John chapter 13, 16. There John records for us the Last Supper, uh, prior to Jesus' rest, and we see also Jesus there washing his disciples' feet. And after he was finished, he said a few things, and he said this also. He said, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. John thirteen sixteen. And this word messenger here is translated from apostolos, or apostles. So therefore, when we look at this in context, there is a sense here that according to Jesus, every one of his disciples, and that would include you and me today, are not only servants, which can also be translated slaves, but also messengers or apostles of Christ. Apostles of Christ. Another meaning that is attributed to the word apostles is described for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You can turn there in your Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In this chapter, Paul, about, I think, halfway in there, or a few, a number of verses down, commends Titus and others, and these others he calls brothers, he commends these folks to the Corinthians. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23, As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker for your benefit, and as our brothers, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Now, I use the ESV as translated apostolos, Messengers. Messengers. So these are the apostles of the churches. We could translate it that way. And the final meaning of apostles in the New Testament is applied to the disciples of Jesus who had been personally chosen by him. We see this in the gospel record records. They were given authority as apostles by Jesus and sent out uh, to uh, proclaimed the gospel, and they were eyewitnesses of the risen Lord, and they had been given uh, spiritual gifts of uh, signs and wonders and so forth and so on. 
And of course, this would include the Apostle Paul, who said that the church was, according to Paul in chapter 2, verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. And Paul, again, I said, is one of those apostles. And it was to these chosen apostles that Paul would go on to explain in chapter 3 that the, that the mystery of Christ had been revealed. That mystery of Christ included the gospel. We see this in chapter 3, verse 5. It has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Holy Spirit. And not only, as I said, the gospel, but the revelation from the Holy Spirit to actually write the New Testament that we have here. That's why we call it the inspired word of God. So we have these three meanings in the New Testament for the word apostles. But now I want to go back to the motivation, to one of the motivations for our study today, or at least one of the motivations I want to share with you in the form of a question. How does the contemporary church reflect the truth that Paul put down in his letter to the Ephesians? To be more specific, the question could be, how was Paul using the word apostle? And let's throw in prophets here as well, here at verse 11. How are these two offices to be applied today to the church? Was Paul speaking uh, of those that the churches sent out, the apostles to the churches? Apostle and prophets of the churches? We can translate it that way. Or is Paul speaking of the apostles and prophets that he describes here in his letters, the foundation of Christ's church? You know, those chosen personally by Jesus Christ and eyewitnesses of his resurrection. Because here's the, here's, the, here's, here's the reason I'm asking these questions. Because never more in Christian history is it more important than ever to understand what this means. Now, I want to give you an example. And it's been working like this for over three decades. There's this movement, what can only be described as a counterfeit and unbiblical movement, has been gaining more and more support in the church worldwide. At the very core of this movement is apostate and heretical. This unbiblical movement, however, is so difficult to describe and put together, and one doesn't really know where to begin and end. Because it has no official organization, although it is organized. It doesn't have a common creed per se, yet it has many things in common. It is not a specific denomination or denominations, yet the movement has infiltrated many denominations. So it is a loosely knit uh, organization with unaffiliated network of leaders. And these leaders in this movement share a common vision and goal for the church today. Some have uh, attributed uh, and called this uh, movement the New Apostolic Reformation or NAR. And there are recognizable traits and common sayings used by the followers of this movement. And the one that concerns us today is the meaning and application of the word apostles. And according to this movement, the church is now in the second apostolic age. Hence the word, the new apostolic reformation. You see, God, according to this movement, has established new apostles on earth. They've been appointed by the anointing of the laying on of hands to represent and speak for God in the earth. And these new apostles are equal to the original apostles that witnessed Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And in the same way, these new apostles are appointed by Christ himself to the office of apostle. And because they are commissioned by God himself, it is expected that their authority may not be questioned. And by the way, God has not only, according to this movement, restored the office of apostle, but they've also restored the office of prophet, as it was in the early church, with the ability to speak the very word of God, in other words, new revelation, outside of the scripture. And as Paul was talking about unity in his letter in the church, Unity in the NAR movement is to bring, they're all on board of this, to bring heaven to earth. And this is done with signs and wonders and uh, uh, experiences of the Holy Spirit that are really, quite frankly, not biblical. And, and so much more. And often, and I would say more often than not, it comes at the expense of biblical doctrine and denominational distinctives. And what's got caused is Carter sort of started to uh, infiltrate into different 
areas of the Christian church. And we find it brings leaders together from, you know, say the charismatic circles, the reform, the word of faith, the seeker sensitive, the progressive, and even the Roman Catholic under this one big tent called the New Apostolic Reformation. And one of the main focuses of this movement is revivals. And they hold these revivals in stadiums and, of course, because of live streaming and the internet, they can, they can broadcast across the world these days. And it's always the emphasis on the next big thing that God is doing. God did this last year, now God is doing this thing, as their prophets so foretell. And one last little piece, even though Maybe most of the followers or some of the followers, I'm not sure on the numbers, I would say, would believe the inerrancy and authority of the Bible. It's just the Bible is not enough anymore. It's always more. More is always the goal. Always new revelation from God himself, signs and wonders, trips to heaven and hell, and so forth and so on. And some of the captions that you might hear around and you might have heard or you might see or hear or read uh, go like this. Supernatural signs and wonders. You might have heard of the Latter Rain Movement, Joel's Army, the Seven Mountain Mandate, IHOP, in other words, the International House of Prayer, Bill Johnson's Bethel Church, and, and of course, the music arm, Jesus Culture, Hillsong Media Empire. And these are just some of, of who are part of this movement in one way or another. And what's happening is church after church has been taken up into this apostate movement. And many, many, I don't know how many are being deceived and they're not even aware of it. So the question remains, how are we to understand how the Apostle Paul was using the Apostles and Prophets here in verse 11? May I strongly suggest that he met the original meaning, those chosen and authorized by Jesus himself, eyewitnesses of the risen Christ. Based on this alone, we can say with confidence, in this sense, there are no apostles today. And the NAR has no leg to stand on despite their manipulation of the Bible. Paul also included the prophets in the same sense. No one should presume today, no one, to claim inspiration equal to that of the biblical prophets. No one should presume to say, thus saith the Lord, or this is the word of the Lord. Because if that was truly the word of the Lord, then we would need to add their words to this Bible, your Bible, all Bibles, and then everyone will need to listen and obey those words. Well, friends, this leaves us with the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers. And sadly, we cannot really do too much here with that. We'll have to leave this for a future study. And maybe you can do some on your own, which I would recommend. You do it anyways. But we can answer one last question. Why did Jesus give to the church these remaining offices? And we'll focus, I would say, more on the, the, the pastors, the shepherds, same word, or teachers, which sometimes can be both, and another day for that. Well, in summary, the office of pastor, shepherd, and teachers of the church has been given by Christ to bring all into unity of the faith, to bring us together in the faith and trust of Christ, and then the knowledge and grow in our knowledge of Christ to spiritual maturity. And then the believer, the church itself as well, will not be tossed, as Paul says, to and fro here, carried by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, by deceitful schemes. That's verse 14. My friends, the church today that Paul is speaking to, in our, the true church today that Paul is speaking to, pardon me, in our text will be marked by speaking the truth in love. Verse 15, the biblical truth. And even as many come under the bewitching power of seeking experience after experience, the next new thing around the corner, the false promises of movements like the NAR, the true church today will be built upon, build itself up in love as they grow together in unity of faith and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. And I pray for those who have, whether they know it or not, uh, been under this bewitching power of the NAR movement, movements like that, word of faith, God, uh, uh, they are being deceived. And I pray, God, that you, by your mercy and kindness, and, uh, would, re would rescue them from that.
And for all of us, Lord, I pray that we not only would hear these words today, that we would uh, think about them thoroughly, that we would study more about this issue, that we would look at this text on our own, prayerfully, and that from there we will walk together in the unity of the faith. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for having me with you. God bless. Shalom.